He's a killer in Missouri. I'm Reggie Bailey. This is episode 27, according to this thing here, of yeah. the Books of Pop Culture podcast. Yes, Killy, yes. how you feeling today, brother? I am feeling refreshed, uh, you know, uh, excited. As you can see, I, I just left our beloved We The Best barbershop, Fresh Line. Um, you know, the fro is froing. Uh, it, it would mm-hmm. seem that all is right in my universe. How about you, Bridger? Hey, man, I um, I can't complain. Can't complain, man. It's a it's a good enough day out. I was kicking it with Sebastian and Penelope, which are my cats. For anyone who doesn't mm-hmm. know, um, mm-hmm. so I cannot complain. I'm glad they are not in a super position. Yes, that's what yes. I'm glad they're not in. Yes. Um. Anywho, um, thank you to the fellowship. First and last time listeners, first and last time viewers, everyone in between, all of you appreciate it because you could be anywhere in the world right now, but you are here with us. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us, like us, follow us, review us, definitely leave a comment, definitely tell folks that you're kicking it with us. Uh, The Fellowship, which is the group I greeted first. Is Books of Pop Culture's amazing Patreon community. It's a community that Achille and I biasly and objectively believe is the best in bookish communities. A community you can join by going to patreon.com slash books of pop culture. By joining the fellowship, you are choosing to support the most dynamic of duos in the bookish landscape. You'll receive bonus BAPC material each month. And most importantly, you get us one step closer to doing books of pop culture for a living. Follow us on Books of Pop Culture on Instagram and also visit the Books of Pop Culture bookshop so you can get our books of the month. Achille. Word. We got a a special guest, bro. We got a special guest. Special guest. Don't you you enjoy saying that? We have a special guest. It's really really nice. I do. I like... um, I like saying it because they they are special. Yeah. I hope they don't think it's. I hope they don't think I'm like. Um, you know how the parent tells like What's... all the kids. You, you're you my, favorite. favorite. You're yeah. my favorite. You're my think, favorite. You're my favorite. Yeah, like I hope yeah. they don't think it's like that. Like I really mean it. Like for real. Yeah, yeah I can dig yeah. it. So I can like, dig it. Like for real, for real. But yeah, yeah. Today's guest holds a Bachelor of Arts from Skidmore College and an MFA from New York University. She's received honors from PEN America. Bread Loaf's Writers Conference, Virginia Center for Creative Arts and Voices of Our Nation Arts Foundation. Her fiction, essays, and criticism have appeared in the likes of Time, The Washington Post, The Kenyan Review, Quelly Journal, among other publications. She also teaches creative writing to undergraduate students at Fordham University and graduate students at the Writers Foundry MFA program at St. Joseph's College in Brooklyn. If you haven't figured it out, we have Clavis Natera in the building today. Naruda on the park. Yes, yes. Yeah. Hi. It's so good to be here. It is. Yes, it is great yes. to be here. I'm excited to ask you about this wonderful novel you wrote. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> about yes. this ex- exciting novel you wrote. Like, there's so much to say. There's so much, so much. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's on me. Of course. Tommy. I mean, so I don't know if Reggie had the time to inform you of the first question, uh, okay. because we all know I was having some technical difficulties <laughs> getting inside of the programming today. I don't know um, what was going on. I don't know if it was a little gentrification of the microphones or what, but the world, the man Always was trying to keep me out. But the it's first true. question, the first question that we usually ask is, how are you doing genuinely? And when we um, when we ask that question, you can tell us if you're having if you're having like a poopy day, um, if uh, you know if you have trap gas is always a go to, um, or if you had the most splendid breakfast of all this morning. So how are you doing today, Clavis? Like for I, real, I am though. having a blissful day. I have to wow. tell you. I mm. I'm sorry that the gentrifiers got your mic, Achilles. Yeah. That's that's yeah. whack. They didn't yeah. get mine. I got a fancy one, gentrified good, good. proof. 
my my day is going really well. You know, I've just been on cloud nine. Uh, for those yeah. who don't know me, it took me 15 years to get this book out into the world. Yeah. And so over the last two weeks, three weeks now since it's been out, I've just been on, on a cloud. It's just a really yeah. blissful time in my life. What does that feel like? I was, when I read that and I think with the epilogue at the beginning of it, you said 15 years. Like, what is how, how do you how do you compress 15 years in like a few weeks? What does that feel like when you are like at this finish line? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can, you know, I've, I've <laughs> yeah. been feeling really weepy like the last yeah, few yeah. days because, mm -hmm. you know, there's something that happens when you've been working on a book. And like at least my book came out the heels of a failed book that mm. I wasn't able to sell right out of my MFA program. And what happens out in these streets is that, you know, especially when you're in these very entitled spaces that are mostly white, is that you're brought up to believe that it's just going to happen. That as yeah. long as you've got the talent and you're putting in the hard work, it, like, you know, carpets are gonna roll out. And wow. for me, that's not what happened at all. Like my first book, I wasn't able to sell it. And so, you know, when I started working on this project, it was really the project I was working on as a relief from this other project because it was like with, you know, my agent and like we we're making mm -hmm. moves. And so from there, you know, to having the other book fail, putting that book away, I was working a full time job, a corporate job that kept getting bigger yeah. and bigger and bigger. And so for me, it was just you know, just a lot of life that happened. And I think for anyone who reads the book, I think that that's part of the reason why there's so much in it, you know, because I didn't yeah. want to compromise the second time. I was like, you know, I'm going to write the book I want to write. Word, word. Sure. That kind of segues into, I believe, Reggie's uh, first uh, general yeah. question. Reggie, uh, you know, she's, you know, Clavis is really a writer. Remember, we were off the air yesterday and I was telling you, and when you when you get your Rockefeller chain as a writer, they give you your Toni Morrison picture in the background. And I see the Toni go. Morrison picture is there. So yeah. it's official now. 15 oh, years yeah. of, or no 15 years. It is official. Hey, and, <laughs> and there's um there's some YouTube videos out too, um, mm -hmm. with Clavis like from Random Host. And mm -hmm. like I, I know she really she really in it too. Just talking yeah, about yeah. like um just like reading her her joy for it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so the question that I ask here is what is and and feel free to answer this in the plural, although I ask in the singular every time, what is the most important lesson you've learned about the business mm -hmm. of writing, all things considered, I guess I should say. Yeah, I mean, I think we could spend the whole time talking about the hard knock life because <laughs> these, people try, these people try to break me. Um, yeah. I think I would say the first the first lesson that I like to share with people is that, um, you know, I think that my sanity and my self-preservation at one point became more important than artistic productivity. And so, you know, there was a time when, you know, it's, it's very hostile out there for writers of color. For me, you know, being an immigrant from the Dominican Republic, you know, it's, it's been like a really interesting journey because at a certain point, I remember like purposefully leaving the community, my community, which wasn't the right thing to do, my writing community, but just feeling like all of it hurt too much. And yeah. being like, you know what, this is not good for me to be in an environment where I'm feeling like so bruised. And so for many years, I was just working on my own. And, you know, the second learning I would say is that you actually can move forward as a writer without a community. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, for me, it was both parts of it that are really critical that I would invite, you know, writers to think about and people who are just out here trying to make it, whether it's through a podcast or a platform like the, the wonderful space the two of you are building or just the rest of us that are trying to create. Um, and Achille, I know you're working on, on, on your own book and, and um, following that path. And so there are just times when you gotta like take your foot off the gas and like go away from, from the places and the people that will hurt you. And then there are times when you have to acknowledge that you can't really go anywhere without a community. And that's why yeah. I came back about four years ago when I realized I couldn't do it by myself anymore. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Every time I hear that, like I just every time I see like one of you guys say, uh, well, it took me 15 years, eight years, seven years, um, I get like 
relaxed a little bit because at first I was like, I need to be, you know? Um, but I think, you know, so much of that experience gets into the writing um, and it makes it, you know, amazing like this book is. So uh, I'm yeah. thankful uh, to be yeah. in any sort of community with people like you. Thank For sure. You. And, and I usually have like another tradition here, but I think what I'm going to do today is mm -hmm. revisited later because you actually transition into like a great question, great set of questions. I think Achille and I can ask you about Naruto, right? Yeah. And and one of them is about the characters' relationships to rest, right? Mm -hmm. Like like you literally were just talking about how you chose your sanity over productivity, right? And what I have here is you know rest lives in an interesting life in Naruto Park. Reina is opposed to it. Says she cannot take over the world while she is asleep, she says. Yeah. Luz recommends that Reina gets more rest, but while on a date with Hudson, said that we don't do that when she was asked to take a break from law, right? Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. then almost lost another gig later on because she mentioned the word balance during the interview, yeah. right? Then uh, you got uh, Elsebia comes up with a crime plan while she is sleeping, Right. And the tongues felt like their turn to sit down and protect the neighborhood was an opportunity for them to rest. Right. So this this question is a bit ironic. And that's why I love that I get to ask it. Can you speak to us further about the work you hope rest is doing in Neruda Park? Man, I've been like daydreaming about these questions because y'all really bring them. This yeah. is so delightful and wonderful. I love that question. And no one has asked. Um, about rest. I mean, you know, I think it's really interesting. First of all, being an immigrant, because yeah. I just remember from the time I got to this country, I was 10 years old. Somebody already gave me a job. I had to babysit mm. somebody. And yeah. I was like, wait a minute. I haven't even like gotten my zip yeah. code. I didn't even know where I live. And I was already babysitting my little nieces and my cousins. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's to me really interesting that I think so much of American exceptionalism and this idea of individual exceptionalism in this country is rooted in the idea of hard work. And for most of us that have been in like corporate environments, we know that the higher up you go in the corporate ladder, the less you do. It's like you have more responsibility and it's like the responsibility is, you know, kind of like your expertise. And so I've had a lot, a lot of, um, thoughts about this because as I was climbing the corporate ladder, I worked in an insurance company for, you know, for two decades before I quit my job a little bit, like a year and a half ago, I quit my job to like pursue writing full time. And I just remember like when I was really climbing aggressively, like having this idea that, you know, you don't slow down, you know, the people who slow down are the people that get left behind. And mm -hmm. when I think about, you know, my Dominican culture, which is very different, like in Dominican culture, I mean, things can be hard, but you're going to nap. You're going to like have a good time. There's always going to yeah. be time to, you know, when I go back to the R, I'm always amazed because even people who are like in very dire economic situations are hanging out and having a good time. And it's like really built into the culture, this idea of enjoyment, especially like sensual or like physical enjoyment. And so, you know, for me, I really wanted to have my characters, especially Luz and Elsevia. I wanted these two characters to really be confronted with the idea of like, what does it mean to achieve personal liberation? What does it mean to fight for your home or for purpose, you know, which is, you know, a question they both are grappling with. And then like, how does it feature? Cause you know, for Luz, she falls in love with this white rich developer of this building. And they're spending a lot of sexy time in bed. You know what I mean? Yeah, like a yeah, lot of yeah. like what's happening there. It's like in this concept of like, you find your path through like bliss and enjoyment, right? Versus her mother's not sleeping very much when she comes up with this with this thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah did you like hudson uh reggie i like hudson in the sense that like i like his character in a book okay. you know like okay. like hudson hudson definitely makes a book more interesting would i would i, I was, kick it with hudson uh, probably not but like probably not mm -hmm. I, i'm grateful that naruto on the park had hudson okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i hated him i hated him a lot. <laughs> um i was hating on him um, I, yeah, I wasn't enjoying Hudson. I mean, I, like you said, I, we needed Hudson. 
Yeah. Um, but I will. I wanted to help them push Hudson out. Um, in fact, I joined the ranks of uh, uh, Usebia's plan. Um, it was me helping uh, destroy the neighborhood, unfortunately. Um, and For I sure. wrote, I wrote, you know, Hudson, go home um, in in an alleyway. That was me. Um, yeah, but, I but... mean, if if anything, I was ready to fight Liam. Oh Ooh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Liam definitely can catch them hands, but I feel yeah, like because like Liam's the... supposed to know better. I feel like the reason he doesn't is because someone made him catch the hand so many times uh, growing up that he becomes who he becomes. Yeah. 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 But it's on me now. And I want to take the, the this this concept of of, of hustle hustle culture a little bit further. Um uh me and Reggie were talking about this uh just last night. It'll come out tomorrow. Um, but Trisha Hersey has this uh work called the Nap Ministry. Have you you mm-hmm. heard about that yes. at all? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this concept of rest as as resistance. Um, I'm not, you know, particularly an expert of it. And if anything, I'm probably closer to hustle culture and its propensity towards toxi- toxicity in the way like that I kind of work hard. But as I was reading your book, it made me think about how everyone was pulling loose towards this hustle culture. And she decides to take that time to rest, as Reggie was talking about. One thread I've seen with the ministry uh, is the tracing back of hustle culture to white supremacy. And it made me think about how everyone was in line and step with it. And it hit home for me when Hudson said um, he w- he hadn't taken a vacation in 10 years. Mm-hmm. And personally, I think one of the reasons that hustle culture is labeled toxic is because it affords Hudson a particular lifestyle. And when we try to participate in that, you know, in this idea of meritocracy, we run up against those boundaries um, do you agree with hustle culture uh, possibly being linked to white supremacy? And does Hudson exist as an example of that for you uh, with his reluctancy to see his development as part and parcel to the neighborhood's response? Oh, I mean, without a doubt, I think mm-hmm. hustle culture is tied to like capitalism. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that when we consider chess for those of us who have studied you know, from the slave narratives all the way through to, you know, immigrant stories, right? And we consider like the ways in which our bodies have been used. Any of us who have been part of the underclass, I mean, and marginalized communities, you know, it's it's really like we're sold this idea that yeah. we can overcome boundaries that exist between the classes. Like it is totally scalable if we're just willing to work hard enough and put our bodies into it. And I'll tell you that like my mother, um, you know, she, she was the one that came here first um, with, through my family, through her side. Mm -hmm. And she worked, you know, for many years at a factory, putting together perfume bottles in, in New Jersey, actually where I live now. And then eventually she switched over to a different job, which most of my aunts did at the time as a health, a home health aide. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when she was working as a home health aide, she was living with, you know, elderly folks in New York City for anywhere between 12 and 24 hours as I was growing up. When she finally brought us over, she had to work 24 hours a day because that's the only way she could afford, you know, to have four kids here. Mm -hmm. And to me, like what I think is kind of crazy when I think about my mom, I mean, like my mom's body physically broke under the employment yeah. like she you know she was taking care of of someone and giving them a bath and they slipped and she had to like grab them and mm-hmm. so since then she's been like you know she's uh her back is torn up and she has so many issues um and so to me like that's a really very extreme and like real way in which i think like our bodies are at the cost you know yeah but when i think like what you're talking about the hustle mentality which means like Every moment of every day, you should be accomplishing something that pushes your life further into an ideal. But what is the ideal? The ideal is always material success. We're never like, oh, put on all your time into bettering your community or tutoring children that need it or helping the elderly get a meal. I mean, when Mm -hmm. we're talking about hustling, we're talking about Mercedes Benz and, you know, all these things, right? Like fancy shoes and fancy bags. Um, so there is no doubt in my mind that there's this this huge um, lie that most of us participate in because we yeah. know that like the more we have, the more that our life is considered worthy. Yeah, yeah. there. Yeah, that makes me think about um, 
when I have a question about it later, but just it just brings up that scene that Reggie was alluding to with Liam, uh, Liam, um, because everybody in there is complicit. You know, mm -hmm. uh, everybody there is taking part in in this lie and the perpetuation of it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that response. No, and that just like like I'm just stuck on the part where you're like, you know, no one is um doing it for like I guess non material uh, success. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that a lot of people think success without material isn't success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's just um, I appreciate your answer too. a uh, long, long way to way of saying that. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, so going back a little bit on the first page of Naruto Park, I found this funny because um, I recently experienced this. Right. Um, Elsevia, who is, you know, uh, Luz's mother, uh, for those who, you know, haven't read yet, um, has this reluctancy towards calling Luz black. She'll instead use a phrase like hardly any milk there. And I, mm. I bring this up because recently, right, I was I was traveling a little bit. And when I was when I went to the airport, I had to take a shuttle. I parked my car somewhere where there was a shuttle and they had to take me to the airport. So when I got to the airport and I was finally getting in line, checking in, right, I checked for my phone because it was a line. I was just going to play on my phone for a little bit while I was waiting. I realized I didn't have my phone with me. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going outside. I ended up, you know, finding a shuttle, right? And when I found the shuttle, um, you know, I told him, like, yo, you know, I was, um, I was in one of your other cars. It's the same company. Here's the card right here. Um, you know, whatever, whatever, right? So... The person who was dri who drove me from the shuttle to the airport was a black dude, mm. but it was a white dude who I caught on the street, and he was like, "Who drove you?" Um, <laughs> I didn't know the guy's name, right? But mm -hmm. he was trying to describe other people. Was he? He was like, "Was he this? Was he that?" I was like, "He was. He was big and black like I am." Like yeah. I just and I said it like that because I was like, "Why are you so scared to say black?" Mm -hmm. Right? And that that scene made me think of that. Right? And I wanted you to speak to us just about the reluctancy to say black within this community we see at, at North Park, right? And um and just the commentary you're hoping to make uh with said reluctancy. Yeah. I mean yeah thank you for that. And I'm glad I'm glad that you were just kind of like let's call a spade a spade. Bro a like black yeah, yeah. Man. <laughs> I, I am not gonna be offended if you say the yeah. word black. But yeah. also, I think like the context is it's I think kind of the same whether we're talking about you know yeah. my Dominican community, yeah. um, and this kind of like in inherited. You know, I think a lot about the proximity to whiteness and how it is rewarded across mm -hmm. the globe, right? Whether you're like yeah. in countries that have been colonized or whether you're like in places that. You know, they didn't have to colonize because it just wiped everybody else. Right. Yeah. Um, I think a lot about how often like black people just are reluctant to call themselves black because, you know, it's, it's very clear that in most societies, black people are the underclass. Yeah. And so, you know, I think it is very often to me and, and I laugh about it, too, sometimes because in like my own experience and I'll start from the personal before I get into the book. Um, you know, I started calling myself black when I was in college, you know, and I mean, 20 years ago, I know you're shocked. I went to college 20 years ago. And look <laughs> at me looking so young and fly. But it's like, right. listen, 20 years ago, when I was, you know, when I graduated from college, calling myself black was a revolutionary act, you know, yeah. as a Dominican woman, as a Latina, because no matter your skin tone, even black Americans didn't consider us black people. And I would mm -hmm. argue there are still a lot of people who don't consider Spanish speaking black immigrants part of the black diaspora in America. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, like it was just really interesting getting hostility from both sides. I mean, I'm getting the hostility within my own family because they're like, what are you talking about? You're not black. You're mestiza, you're mixed, morenita. I mean, any word other than negra, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And when I started pushing up against it and being like, I think it's beautiful. I cut off all my hair. You know, I wanted to grow a natural. And then it was like, why are you trying to be black? Like, you're also white. You're also from like Spanish descendancy, right? Yeah. And so the idea that I was like, I, I, I mean, look at me. I think like, 
the black people want now in this body yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what i mean like <laughs> so this idea that you're like supposed to align yourself with whiteness because it'll make you safe it's yeah. really what we're talking about here and like you know what is the price of admission into whiteness in the in this country like you align yourself with blackness and very often you're risking your your body your life and mm -hmm. so you know i i always felt very strongly that that we have to confront that and it's been like my lifelong you one of the things i believe most strongly about is to 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 like confront it and to say it and to just use the word you know yeah. just like reggie you were saying like we just have to use the word black we all have to get comfortable yeah. and i know imani when imani was talking to you all a couple of days ago and she was like you know there's so much room in blackness you know and yeah. that struck me as like this beauty and like this it's so profound that it's like there's so much room in blackness but you know in the book what i'm trying to say is that there's a lot of discomfort within my own culture we've come a long way because there's a movement now especially with younger people who are so proud to be afro dominicanos afro latinx you know there's just like this bubbling over of pride to like you know just just take it and call it what it is and and you know all the parts of our histories that have been brutally erased to say no we're going to discover them we're going to reveal them we're going to um celebrate them and and i want that to be part of the conversation that comes out of my book um yeah. and you know and i think i think for me in my own journey it's been you know it's been really important to think about expanding this concept of what it means to be an American. So it isn't just about mm -hmm. race, yeah. but also like who gets to belong, who gets to yeah. call the place home, who yeah. gets to say, you know, whether I sound a certain way or look a certain way, I belong here. And like, you know, I don't have to be kind. I don't have to be grateful. Like I've already earned my stay with all the effort and all the work I've done over the years mm -hmm. I've been here. And so have my, my forefathers and foremothers. For sure. And, Absolutely. and, um, you know, you, you saying that part at the end reminds me of, you know, Toni Morrison, right. Who you have behind you where like, there's a quote that I'm going to butcher here. I'll, I'll say, I'll say this instead. I'm paraphrasing, um, mm. where she says, you know, if you're white, you're just American, but everybody else is, is a hyphen. Right? A hyphen and, yeah. and nonetheless, right. Even, even though like, I don't, you know, I'm, I just consider myself a black American. I don't put no hyphen. I put a space between it, but you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just like, I know I belong here and I'm glad that also, you know, too, you know, and just, I'm, I'm sure everybody in here know we belong here and it ain't nothing nobody can do about that. Why, why? Is it, is it on me, Reggie? Yes. Okay. I think, all right. All right. I think so. When, you, when we're having too much fun, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it gets, you know, it gets hard to, yeah. you know, and then I, you know, I can't count. And so, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, uh, and, and Yelica, right. Comes to lose in a frenzy. Because uh, Christian has declared themselves non-binary, gender uh, non-conforming. Um, because like she says it's, it's not enough to be poor, Dominican, and Black. Um, ever since I've been in grad school, I've been torn um, by middle class, highly educated people's propensity towards the world that they say they want to live in uh, and the theories and the words that the world necessitates um, and the world the people, those people make decisions about and their relationships to them, right? I feel like this scene is important because it shows a clashing of those two worlds. Uh, and Yelica is not, at least to me, against Christian's decision and urgency. She's against what she knows the world will do to them uh, because of it. She's suggesting that they've already got so much ahead of them. Why add to it? Why was this important for you to tease out? Because I believe these two worlds need to meet in the way that Angelica and, and uh, Luz met there where Luz was like, what are you talking about? College might be the safest place uh, for them when they make this decision. Why do you? Why was that important to kind of tease out this clashing of those two worlds? Uh, because I don't think they often meet each other uh, like they did in that scene. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, great question. I, you know, I was thinking a lot, actually, and, and you, it's not just a photo of Morrison. It's also like Morrison's influence on my work and on mm -hmm. myself as a reader and a writer. And, you know, I've always been haunted by Beloved. I've always been yeah. haunted by, you know, by this idea of, of like what we're willing to do to, to ensure that like the next generation doesn't suffer as much. 
And, you know, and beloved, it's like such a, an extreme case because there you have like an enslaved woman who like murders her child to like keep mm -hmm. them from having to experience. And there have been times when I read the book and I think it was a mercy. And then there are times mm -hmm. when I read the book and I think it's a crime. Yeah. And it just depends on where I am in my own life. Um, but certainly when I became a mother, it became really clear to me that this idea of any of us who have been in caretaking situations and Angelica is, you know, Christian's sister, but really for all intents and purposes has raised, mm -hmm. you know, Christian. And this idea of Christian being non-conforming in very different ways. I mean, Christian, you know, Ben's gender in terms of like how they present, how mm -hmm. they speak. Um, Christian is a, an artist. And yeah. so, you know, I really wanted to show because I find that so often within our communities, you know, it's like if someone's ignorant, they're just ignorant. They're stupid. Mm -hmm. they, they're, you know, closed off and they're not open minded about difference where I think a lot of times that fear comes from love, from a place of love. And so much in this book that spirals out of control, like the city's love. And that for me was so important, like addressing every single one of my characters. I was like, I want them to be, you know, just, just always coming at things from a place of love. And so Angelica comes to her childhood friend. They've broken apart, right? They've, mm -hmm. they've had a, a very fraught relationship. Um, since Luz went away to college and then came back and went to, you know, an Ivy League law school. And so their relationship is very fraught. But the one thing that Angelica is going to do is ask for help because she's like, you know, you know what it takes to survive in these environments. It means you have to give up. Whatever yeah. it is that makes you different, you have to fit in. You have to sell out. And so I also wanted, you know, for Luz to be confronted with, with like the choices she has made in her life that have kept her, you know, uh, away from her community. And so yeah. in that moment, you know, she has to kind of like go back to like the receipts. Like, has she been there for her friend in the way that she could have been? And I wanted that to be like, you know, kind of like the, the, the text. And then mm -hmm. the subtext is you know about this request from her best friend to like help you know and angelica cannot give in to you know the pronouns right she's yeah, kind of yeah. like yeah. him 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 mm -hmm. him and and lose mm -hmm. is like they 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 like it's not mm -hmm. a heart like respect and yeah. so you know for me it's just so much of it and i think when we think about the richness of of, you know, the, the bodies of work of people like Toni Morrison and, you know, Jasmine Ward and, you know, some of the people that I love, Julia Alvarez. Like, I think they've always been able to expose the tensions within our community without feeling like we have to come up with an answer. I mean, as a writer, I don't really have the answer, but I really want to put it there to be like, what gets in our way? And if we all agree that it's love is the seed, let's kind of like deal with that from a place of love and accept it. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Reggie, it's, go, go ahead, because I got something to say about something you going to say later. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, like I think of, um, so so D. Watkins, who's the author of a book that just came out called Black Boy Smile. He's also um, an author of another book I've read called We Speak for Ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that he talks about a lot is like the access to information and how that is a privilege. There's this essay that came out in 2014 he wrote called Too Poor for Pop Culture. Mm -hmm. And it just I, I can't quote it verbatim or anything like that. But basically, you know, he talks about how, you know, some people he may go up to who are just caught up in the grind, caught up in the hustle and try to show them like this meme. At the time, they might say, what's a meme? You mm -hmm. know, right. Mm -hmm. And it's just like it's the same thing sometimes with just these ideas we have about around race, gender, class and everything. What so mm -hmm. many people are trying to do because I try to do it is just pay the bills. So mm -hmm. I have I have like, you know, all these books around me and stuff, right? And I and I try my best to read them. So by yeah. all means, I've been exposed to things that I uh wouldn't have known otherwise, but I was telling Achille last night, we mentioned um we was recording yesterday, I was telling him I learned about the word patriarchy, its Patriot, existence, yeah, yeah. Yeah. probably like in 2016. Mm -hmm. but I didn't learn what it meant for real until about 2017. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's just like yeah. we, we have to consider that like everyone is just living a life and that life is a journey. And that journey is going to take different amount of times for you to get to like complicated, sophisticated ideas. 
Yeah, but you yeah. know, I would even go a little bit beyond that, that this idea that people that are more educated are more open-minded is false. I mean, it's, mm. it's true. true. Like, we wouldn't be in, like, the yeah. shitty hellhole we are as a country so if true. this were true, that's, you know, if so people true. were open. I mean, think about what happens to Black trans people in this country. I mean, yeah. mm. unfathomable. So anytime that I think about this idea that there's, like, more kindness and more acceptance, the more educated you are, or that somehow education means more humanity, which is often what we're talking about. It's yeah. not true. It's not true. Yeah, yes. that makes me think about, um, cause that's, that's what I think I'm trying to get at. Cause I've been talking about this for a while, right? Because like when you're in those rooms with these people who are, who are, you know, educated, right? And you, you're talking about things that affect those people in those communities. It seems like the education is making them more hard and callous, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're the ones that get to make the decisions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it makes me think about um uh Chantal was talking about about this about this concept too, right? Like it's it's just it like you said, it's just not true, right? And I think that the what what your what your what this scene gets at is that the marrow of that, right? Um, where it, it just opens it up and allows it to kind of be seen, right? Yeah. I think that's something um when I was talking about when I was like, go ahead, Reggie, that's something that Reggie has something, a question about in terms of Morrison. Um, and I think it's so cool because when you think about when you think about this, what I was saying about like writers having Morrison in the background and Baldwin in the background and these other writers in the background, they're saints, right? Like they're mm -hmm. they're like almost like patron saints of, of writing. Uh, so I hope Reggie oh. kind of goes into that question yeah. soon. But I, I think. You. Um, I think that's something to be said about when you yeah. do see that in the background of a writer who's created okay. something like these scenes in this book. Go ahead, I, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely follow. Gonna head that way. All right. Yeah. You know, I'm going to follow this path <laughs> yeah. that's been laid out for me. I, so, you know, alley-oop is alley-oop. Yeah. Yeah, of course, <laughs> man. Of course. And as a basketball fan, we dunk those. So uh, the tongues interlude on uh, pages 61 and 62 was so fascinating to me because of the way it spoke to language barriers, blackness, and inspiration. The tongues talk about how long they have been in Northrop Park. The history, uh, surtered, I'm sorry, I'm butchering that word, surtered in them, uh, mm -hmm. the selfishness, sutured? sutured, yeah, sutured in them, mm -hmm. the selfishness, the selfishness with which they hold it in, and how the black folks didn't even notice them and grew suspicious plus more watchful after they heard them speaking Spanish. But even with the language barriers, the tongues knew implicitly when it was their time to protect Northrop Park. And it was always women. Can you speak to us further about the complex life lived by the language barrier in Northrop Park? Right? And I really like in the scene also how you show the tension and understanding all at once. And perhaps uh, what I should really be asking you here is where did that inspiration come from? And my, my last bit here, this is like definitely a quest mint. It's a little bit of everything. <laughs> I especially love the bit where the tongues are surprised by the fact that one of the Watkins sisters was reading a novel by Toni Morrison as opposed to the Bible. Um, I just kind of like what I believe that symbolizes. And I just want mm -hmm. you to talk about everything I said, if it's even coherent. Yeah, it's so coherent. <laughs> I hear like, let's, okay. let's get it on. This okay. is where yeah, you can do yeah. it. I'm yeah. like, let's rock. Yeah. I'm like, you know, let's yeah. get dirty. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, I think I love this question. I mean, listen, like, first of all, this whole idea of like the complexities of solidarity, you mm -hmm. know, because of language. And I, I all the time think about it, how... When I travel, and I travel quite a bit, I mean, I love going, leaving the country. I love traveling around the United States. And, you know, there's this warmth, right, in Black communities where, like, they fold you in. And what I think is interesting is that when they hear an accent, they're like, where are you from? I mean, there's mm -hmm. always that moment where it's like, but well, yeah. where are you from, though? When I'm like, oh, I grew up in New York City. You know, I live in New Jersey. They're like, no, but where are you from, though? Then you know? Are. And there's always right. like a moment of tension where it's like, you, you know, you're not from here. And that's the tension that I wanted to introduce into mm. this idea of like how we as black people can sometimes fall in line and do like the work of, you know, 
like the cis hetero white mm. patriarchal society for you know for the systems like we become tools ourselves by believing that the differences between us whether it's language or you know sometimes it's cultural because there are differences that are culturally driven and so for me like that was one aspect of it that i really wanted to to explore um for me like the inspiration is that I grew up in Harlem. I mean, I grew up in mm. New York City. My entire childhood, I was going to schools that were predominantly black. And, you know, by black, I mean African-American black, black American. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was to me really interesting where like I could be in a line where like I might be the darkest person in a line with like, you know, kids that were like born here, grew up here, whose descendants were here. And there was always the sense that I was the outsider, right? Because no. I was the newly arrived immigrant and maybe I didn't speak Spanish. I, mean, I didn't speak English at the time when we arrived. And so, you know, it wasn't really until I got to college where like I had friends that were from Trinidad and friends that, you know, grew up here in Manhattan. I had one of my best friends like grew up right down the block from me in Harlem. And where like, you know, when we were in a community where like it was predominantly white, it became real clear <laughs> that we were one community, yeah. right? Like the way yeah, that we're yeah. going to make it was only if we were, you know, bonding together and binding ourselves to each other. And so, you know, I'm always really, really interested in thinking about the ways in which the weight of caring for our community so often fall to women and, you know, like going back to your first question about rest, it's also like thankless, unpaid, unappreciated work because it's like all the work. I mean, the whole mess that happened with like the elections, you know, who fixed it? Black women, right? Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. it's like all of a sudden when you think about like some of the people who are under the most threat in this country, they're black women, right? Yeah. Who are like the least be protected, um, who aren't allowed to be children even, you know? There's like so much work that has been done around you know, just how young children and young girls and young boys also are like always considered adults, you know, in, in the eyes of the justice system. And so for me, I just really wanted to be really clear that like my alignment as not just a writer, but as a human being in this country, my legacy, like anything that I, um, you know, anything, any privilege that today those of us who come into this country looking like me and everybody else, as a matter of fact, you know, it happens because of black people in this country, because of yeah. what happened through, you know, civil rights movement. And so, you know, I just wanted to make it really clear that the tongues you know, they themselves have some real issues <laughs> with acceptance. You know, they find Luz very suspicious because, mm -hmm. you know, she has kind of left the community in pursuit of, of, of material wealth. And, you know, but they also are, are tied to this legacy of community service and of community care. Yeah. 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 No, I just uh, y'all got I, me worked up though. I'm here like ooh, yeah. ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I just I just like how in that scene, right? I'm I'm stuck on the Toni Morrison novel being there in place of the Bible, right? I was just because say, yeah. like it's just like for me, it's like where and and you know, forgive me, I, I'm not trying to I, I really admire her, so you know, forgive me everybody, but it's like she's like the god there, she's yeah. the guy. Wow. The guiding yeah. light there, right? Mm -hmm. She is the 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 myth, the legend. Um, I just was so excited that the walking sister had Morrison um mm -hmm. and not a Bible, just in the way yeah. it was phrased. Like you you just it was so well executed. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I definitely feel like for those of us who are coming up these days, I mean, I see the imprint of Toni Morrison's work oh, so often, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I met Robert Jones Jr. Um, I mean, we met because of Toni Morrison, you know, he came to a festival at the time I was partnering with a, a dear friend and we used to put together literary festivals and he came to one. And yeah. so, you know, I, I've always felt that there's this this um community of people and and you know a lot of what you need to know about someone if they have studied Toni Morrison deeply like there's there's just like a a bond that exists that's like familial yeah. and mm -hmm. then it's like any of us who really love Toni Morrison I mean now it's a fervor it is a religion yeah, I mean yeah. oh my goodness I 
I can't even tell you the times people try to talk some shit about Toni Morrison. I'm like, you, I, you gotta stop. Mm -hmm. You gotta stop it because you hey, know I'm look. not even a violent <laughs> person, and I might be brought to blows. <laughs> and I won't fight over many things in life, but talk yeah. shit about Toni Morrison is not gonna go. Yeah, gonna have a problem. I, I have a I have a clip to send you, uh, Clavis. There's someone <laughs> up here right now, not named Reggie or Clavis, who is very disrespectful <laughs> to Toni Morrison. Ooh, oh, you gotta send it to me because it's gonna mm. be on. <sighs> it it <sighs> was not. It was it was not uh, of my own volition. I was pushed to this. He were pushed. Yeah, was pushed. Hmm. Yeah. I, 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 just... I feel like you cannot you cannot not be accountable. We need first of all, <laughs> we're gonna invite you back into the fold. But the first thing is repentance. Okay? Yes. <laughs> you gotta repent. Yeah, brother. yeah, yeah. I I am gonna read that particular book again. Um, but you know. Hmm. We'll see. We'll like see I said, that... I'm not gonna say anything. I'm gonna just send you the video, the and I'm gonna and whatever happens happens. Ones. I love. <laughs> what, what, yeah. Hey, you I don't know nothing. Come uh, all I did was send the video. <laughs> Clavis said, "Send it immediately." <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to do it in real time now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh well. Don't worry, Achilles. Go ahead and find your question, my, brother. I was going to say my next question. question. Yeah, go ahead and find your question. I'm going to send it in real time like she said. So we've been uh, we've been hinting at um, this particular thing um, in, in some of the questions we've talked about, and specifically in the scene that I mentioned earlier. Luz wonders to herself how to do a list of things after that scene. And one of them is how to ask forgiveness when you aren't sorry for moving on, uh, for leaving them behind. I think this speaks to her and, and, and Yelika's uh, relationship, but also her relationship to the community as well. Upward mobility in our communities often necessitates a certain responsibility to that community once you leave. Uh, but no one talks about the strain it takes on those who make that move. How does Luz show the importance of negotiating that space when you when you do uh, seek opportunities outside of your community? And then you come back, right? Because everybody expects her to literally be like a lawyer on retainer. Um, right. So how does she show the the importance of negotiating that space for you? I mean, I think the only way that we can show it is to put, you know, characters in situations where they are forced to confront how, you know, how leaving is both, you know, revered and people think really highly of you. And, you know, there's this sense of pride in the community because she has made it. Um, but then there's also that tension and we see it with Angelica, we see it with mm -hmm. the tongues, right? We see it even between her parents, um, yeah. that there's like that level of tension. And so for me, like the first, the first necessity when it came to really showing the strain of class mobility was to show how disconnected, you know, mm -hmm. Lucy is, how lonely she is. And so my device was to really think about the emptiness that lives inside of her and to like call it out because she's living with this sense of emptiness. And, you know, throughout the book, she's kind of smelling, she's like haunted by this sweetness and she can't figure out what it is for a while. She thinks it's like connected to like her sexy time with Hudson, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, but yeah. as the novel progresses, she gets closer and closer to finding out like, what is this sweet? What is the scent? And the scent is really tied to the community and to like her place in the community and what it means to be generous. Um, and so for me, I, you know, there were, there were those, those ways in which I think are very, um, concrete because i think one of the things that's really hard for us as writers is to really make something concrete that's really hard to talk about mm -hmm. and you know within my own experience you know i went away to college i came back and i felt like every time i got more education people became more suspicious of me <laughs> it was yeah. like mm, like what are you giving up in order mm -hmm. to fit in like what is it that you're doing and also because you change i mean naturally anytime that you're exposed to other people and exposed to other customs you know it isn't just that she has lost her language right i mean lucy is someone who doesn't speak spanish mm -hmm. um but also like that she has become really disconnected from her community in, in like really meaningful and important ways and so for me it, you know it's so important i think within our communities and i see it you know, in all my friends who are, you know, of, of different ethnicities, they, you know, I, I was having this conversation very recently with, with a really good friend of mine who's Indian. And she was telling me like, this, this is, this is true within my community too, that there's this yeah. strain and this tension. 
Yeah. yeah. No, it, yeah. I, it's so interesting. I, I thought about like my um my freshman year in college. Um, I was I was with um like an, another girlfriend at the time. Um, and I'll never forget how we ended up like breaking up or whatever. But part of the reason was she was like, you know, hey, like, you know, I, I like this version of Reggie, that version of Reggie, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I am still him, but I also have more layers because I'm now seeing new things. You, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And um, yeah, you saying that and and you saying that made me think of that. But it also speaks to your ability to um, something that I think shines very brightly in this novel is your ability to show like contrasting views within a community you know um like when we had Amani up i know you mentioned that earlier you know we were talking about the whole black is not a monolith thing Mm -hmm. um and and really no community is a a, a monolith right and of course you know um yeah and speaking of that Mm -hmm. um i want to ask you about surgery Mm, let's right. talk about surgeries. Let's talk about surgery. So uh I should find this this question first before um <laughs> oh <laughs> my god. Uh, see, I, I, this is the part where I want to be like I want to see behind the curtain. Like I want to yeah. see your notes. Oh. I want to oh, see man, like what cuz now I need I don't to know how Reggie's is. I got sure. like, set up. I got a laptop over here. I'll make sure I like find this. that word now because Is it 6? Is it number 6? Is it? Six? Is it oh, Number six. Yes, it is number eight. It's, actually, okay, it's number it was number eight, eight right. cause it's from right. chapter eight. Okay, I feel word, it. Word. We, live. I we live. You see in real time. This ain't edited. So, yeah. chapter eight <laughs> was one of my favorite chapters to read because it showed the many ways in which body work slash plastic surgery, whatever you want to call it, can be received, and it aligned very well with how the generations tend to view it. This resonated with me on a personal level, as I know personally two women who have flown out to the Dominican Republic to get work done on their body. I'd also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, uh, Elsevier's usage of the word man-made during chapter eight. I thought that that word works so well um, when you sit next to her and loses discussion in particular about the possible motivations behind Kuka uh, getting the surgery. Can you speak to the work you hope the varying reactions to Kuka surgery uh, does? And what each reaction is telling us about the women, if it is indeed telling us something. Mm, thank you for that. Uh, yes. Oh, my goodness. First of all, Kuka <laughs> is one of my favorite characters. In I Kuka. love her, too. Oh, I love I mean, Kuka. Kuka. You know, Kuka is, has decided she needs to get an entire body makeover. She's going to DR to like a place where they'll help her lose a bunch of weight. And then they're going to do this entire body makeover because her husband has a wandering eye and she's found evidence of his infidelity which is like all these women that have all these incredible bodies and she has a sense that they're not totally natural you know and so she feels like that is the impetus for her and she you know her sister Elsevia is you know totally outraged because first of all the weight gain was a trauma right Mm -hmm. so for me it's also really important to be sure that we're not like being anti-fat you know Mm -hmm. there's a lot of like beauty I think in like a body all bodies but in this situation we know that you know Kuka has arrived at the situation she is, which is a dangerous medical situation because because of emotional trauma, right? And so when I think about, you know, just how insane it is, and I know so many people who have, you know, who have had surgery within my own community, within my own family, within, you know, my my friends. Um, you know, I also think that it's really bizarre because there was a time where like having surgery was like, it put you in like a very different place in society. It was mm-hmm. like you were either a celebrity or you were like a sex worker, you know, yeah. like it yeah. was, it was, there weren't a lot of like everyday people doing what I consider to be more extreme surgery, which is where like, it's very evident you've had it done. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, the, that was one of the things that changed really drastically during the time that I was writing this book. I mean, this was always one of the themes that I was interested in exploring. It's, you know, the unrealistic beauty standards and how absurd they are. Like nobody can win 
is the mm -hmm. point. You know, like we're all supposed to be deeply unhappy with our bodies, especially women, right? Because I think, uh, yeah. you know, it is a distraction. It is meant to be the distraction that keeps us from really focusing on more important things. And it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So it's the same kind yeah. of underpinning, right? Like the same thing that's destroying the community, this force of capitalism that's destroying the community is the same thing that, you know, is affecting the women's sense of self. And the other part, though, for me is that I also feel like it's it's very complicated because I know people who have had surgery and where it was really the right thing for them to do, where it has like made them feel at home in their bodies, where they mm -hmm. felt you know, they couldn't function, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't do it. And, you know, doing whatever they needed to do brought them to a place of peace. And I support that. But then at the same time, I just want us all, like whether you're a woman or whether you're not, you know, whether you're someone who decides to do something to your body. I just want people to think about what is the, the force behind it. Not within yeah. your own life, feeling unhappy. But why is it that we are so constantly made to feel that there's no right way to be and that the answer is provided by paying for something to be done to us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think it's it's a thing that uh, Luce brings up a lot throughout the book. It's like you, you want us to chase these beauty standards, but then we get talked about for actually reaching for those standards. And so, like you said, it's like nobody can win regardless, right? In, in that, in that uh, what do they call it, rat race. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And, and the worst person to listen to when it comes to like getting advice or confirmation with surgery is a man too. And I can say this as a cis uh, hetero man, because like, mm -hmm. You know, me and my brethren are just not reliable. Like, no matter what you bring to the table, we're going to find something that we don't like. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you get the surgery, you're going to say, oh, you're not natural. But then mm -hmm. if you're natural, it's going to say, oh, you know, we don't like this about you or that about you. And it's just like, don't don't listen to don't listen. If you are a woman who is in the men, do not listen to men when it comes to <laughs> uh, what you want to do with your body. If a man's motivating you, I'm. I'm sorry, that is the wrong guy. Mm. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's Thank see. Thank you for Which saying one? that. I, I think that's really important for us also to be yeah. truthful about these things, you know? Yeah. Seriously. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Do I want to go? Let's go here. Okay. The people who love you most are the ones who will do their best to control you. Love that quote. Even though I hate Hudson, still, um, I can't get over this amazing line. Yeah. When I think about the relationship with love and my relationship with this quote when I first read it, as opposed to when it really hit me, uh, at first I thought about Ray and her mother, right? But by the end, I think everyone is like in this dance with, with this idea, even characters like Christian and Angelica. Uh, which of those characters that exist on the hinges of uh, Elsevia, uh, Luz, Hudson, and Vladimir, do you think had the toughest time with what this quote implies? Hmm. That's a hard question. Mm. <laughs> um, who do I think of my, of my secondary cast has a, a harder time? Um, it's just a dope quote, too. Yeah, it's yeah. a really good, it's a really good mm. question. I mean, I have to say that I think I think it shows up really differently for each of them. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, you know, I would definitely say that Christian is probably the character that has the hardest time mm -hmm. with um, with just this sense of of what the world wants to do to us. And like the the further away you stray from whatever is considered normal, mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot more pressure put on you as a person and so when i think about those of us that live right and we we think about this now like we even have the language of like who are the people that live you know within intersecting identities and when i think about you know what you were talking about before actually when angelica is like black immigrant poor mm -hmm. you know now you're you don't want to be female or or male like what the fuck is left i mean that's what angelica says you know earlier in the book mm -hmm. and so i think for someone like christian who is a very important 
part of this book. I mean, this character is, even though it's a smaller character, I think one of the things that I wanted to do also, because this is someone that was very important in Luz's life. And I think in a way awakens within Luz this sense of responsibility. Um, and so much because they connect. I mean, Christian has been admitted into an Ivy League school. There's like a sense that there is a way forward in which you have to leave your community to be true to yourself. And yeah. so, you know, I think that's the other thing that we sometimes romanticize. Those of us that come from communities that, you know, are rich in culture, or rich in heritage, is that, you know, we forget that sometimes the cost of belonging inside our communities, our own communities, is, you know, this, this kind of cutting right yeah. and it's like yeah. we have to give up who we are and often what that means is sexuality what it mm -hmm. means is like the differences that make us the the most deeply signify who we are within our identities and so yeah i i think that question is is so important i'm gonna be thinking about it i'm gonna have to hit you up tomorrow with a different yeah, answer yeah, yeah. but for right <laughs> now i'm gonna say i think it's christian to me who yeah yeah who like has I'm the most pressure to be controlled yeah, and I think it's 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 beautiful that you say Christian at least today because I, I think like when I'm when I was crafting that question, I'm thinking about uh, them from a from like a craft stand uh, standpoint craft mm -hmm. point, but like you know like you said, Christian is not necessarily a like a huge loud character, and I think what that mirrors right is how people in those communities who who have like so much right going on are put on the fringe and what that does to them and how Christian ends up at that point kind of because of this, you know, um, both, you know, both like from, from, from a craft standpoint and like a, like a form standpoint, but also as like a, a, a human trying to be standpoint and how yeah. in those communities, like you said, sometimes you often have to stand outside of it to even be seen fully. Um, right. And so I was just like, I think it, it would have to be Christian when I was crafting it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm looking forward to who else it could be. Cause like you said, <laughs> everybody has a relationship with that quote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and speaking of fire quotes, I actually have a short question here, but hopefully you'll, you'll appreciate it. Um, early in the book, we learned that Raina always told Luz that the only way to change the world was to take it over rip it out of the hands of those holding on for dear life because no one would give anything willingly. Can you talk to us about the life that quote lives in the root on the park, the importance of it, and even uh, some of the ways you feel it manifests itself uh, through the text? Yeah, I don't think that's a small question either. You got to <laughs> get a mind trick me. That's a, a real question. No big deal. <laughs> that That's like a shorter, like, I appreciate you trying to trick me. I'm not for you. Um, you know, I think I, first of all, you know, this idea too within the book, I mean, you know, I think when like I spend so much time in a book and the way the book transforms often in my own mind um, and like where I started out like way, way before and like where, you know, where it ended up now, it's like such a different place. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, I have to think, uh, I have to think a little bit about this question. I think this question is throwing me a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, no it's, th it's throwing me. No, no <laughs> worries. I'll, I'll, okay. So this one, I think, Akil, if you don't mind me, ball hawking. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. Because there's a the yeah. traditional question that I wanted to hold off until the end. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, yeah, go ahead. um, the, the first question I usually would ask is can you talk to us about your grandmother, father, and grandfather, also Penelope and Julian, to whom the Root on the Park is dedicated to? Mm. Oh, yeah. this is such a sweet question. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah I think this is, this is uh, very emotional. So the book for me is really grappling with this idea of loss. And, you know, the characters all have had to give up quite a bit in order to to be where they are, you know? And I think that's so much part of like what the immigrant um, experiences in this country, but more globally, I think, you know, we all are constantly challenged and, and demanded, right? To, to give up quite a bit to make it as adults. And so for me, I really, I really wanted to 
first of all, think about what brought me to be a writer, which is my father. You know, we left my father when, when we left the Dominican Republic, I was 10 years old and we came here and he stayed behind. And very early on, I started like needing to like formulate within my own mind, like how to explain the experiences I was having, because I knew he had no intention of ever coming here. He had made that yeah. very clear. He had like older children than us that lived here who had tried to convince him to come. And he had said, no, I'm never leaving my country. Um, and so, you know, I always really like that, that seed of me being a writer comes back to me to like calling centers when I had to call my father. And, you know, we only had a couple of minutes because it was something crazy, like a dollar a minute back then mm. and for people that didn't have a lot of money it was very cost prohibitive to like stay in touch with people and so you know so like i think a lot about that about my father um as like really the the first time in my whole life where i realized language matters words matter um my grandmother and my grandfather you know were both like giants in in my life you know like my grandfather uh, was a farmer and you know it, the the way that my family came upon land, which is in the Dominican Republic, you know, like a source of, of wealth and status um, is because, the, you know, there were like some European, this is something I really have to dig into, but it was like there were European people who like had ownership of the land or were granted the ability to like portion of the land from the part of the country where we're from. And they were uh, making choices about who should get it. And so, yeah. you know, the people that they gave the land to were like the most white presenting people that would come, all male, of course, but, and my grandfather wasn't a very light skinned person. I mean, he, he, relatively speaking, he probably was considered that, but he was very tall. And so, mm -hmm. you know, my grandfather always used to say to us that being white was a profession. And, mm. you know, when I was a kid, I never mm. even got that. And the older I got and the more I grappled with this idea of race in this country and, I was like, oh my God, my grandfather was so profound because this idea that early on he was able to like cash in to like yeah. own, like, you know, he didn't have to pay. Like it was gifted to him this land. And because of this land, all of us ultimately ended up in this place, in this country yeah. where our lives became very different. And there are so many people who cannot travel, right? Because they don't have the means. And so that is a quote from my, from my grandfather. I don't think I've ever said this out loud either, but that's always something that, stays with me and you know my grandmother was just formidable i mean so so difficult and uh, you know a tyrant in some ways the way that she manipulated people but also like the biggest heart and fiercely dedicated to her family and you know when she passed away you know three years ago it was like we all knew what would happen to the family when she died and it's that like it would fracture because she yeah. was the one that like, you know, whether it was by love or by, you know, threat, she was keeping people coming every Sunday to her house. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the biggest losses I suffered, you know, during the course of my life today have been, you know, my these three people. And yeah. then um, in the biggest gains, you know, when I think about what I want this book to be is to, you know, grapple with beauty and grapple with loss. And so, you know, for me, like, you know, my my two children, Julian and Penelope, you know, they're the reason the book exists, because I don't think that I would have come back, you know, into what was required of me in terms of persistence and like hard work to make this book actually exist in the world. I don't I don't know that I would have done it if, if I hadn't become a parent. Like, I think becoming mm. a mother really taught me a lot of things about what it means to stick with with what you aim to do. Yeah. yeah. Righteous, yeah. righteous. Yes. Thank you for the easier question. Oh, man. Yeah. No, no, no problem. Um, and and I also ask about uh, the the quotes at the front of the book, mm -hmm. uh, the, the epigraph. Uh, would you do you mind talking to us about uh, who would have said that the earth with this ancient skin would change so much from Pablo Neruda? And also, could you talk to us about remember you are the trunk, not a branch, uh, which is from your grandmother? Yeah, well, the first thing that you learn when you're a writer is about, you know, how people enter your stories. And, you know, if you're a writer nerd, you know that the quotes that come at the beginning of the book are really setting up 
like in a really yeah. grand way what the book is grappling with. So, you know, Neruda for me, I mean, Pablo Neruda, first of all, I've always been like a huge, a huge fan of Pablo Neruda's poetry. Um, you can see it right behind me, like the book, you know, mm -hmm. I, I read it constantly, all the okay. poetry. I read it in Spanish and in English. Um, and so I, I always remember the first time I read that line, I read it in Spanish. And I just couldn't get over how that line lived in my mind, like the way it ignited my imagination. Um, you know, it's almost like when you hold something that sparkles, but there's no light on it. And then all of a sudden, like a light hits it and it's just like glittering. And I remember that being one of those lines. And that happens to me a lot when I read Pablo Neruda. Like there's just, you know, this constant kind of um, igniting that happens within my own imagination. And so... Um, I wanted to think about the ways in which, you know, the earth with skin and the skin as the body. And so much of this yeah. book is concerned with, you know, women's bodies and the human body. Yeah. Um, but then also, like, to me, it's this idea that, you know, I studied English literature where, like, you know, the men are held so high in terms of the literature canon. And who are the fathers of language? Who are the fathers of meaning? And even now, I mean, we can talk about how much has changed and how much hasn't changed, but we know that it's not equal in any way based mm -hmm. on who we know have been the storytellers. Yeah. And so when I turned 40 years old, my, my grandmother, you know, at 40 years old, I had gone through like very a lot of trauma in my life. My son Julian had gone through two bone marrow transplants. We almost lost him. And it was a very, very difficult time that happened when I was 39 years old. And when I turned 40, like... You know, it was also the impetus for me getting back to work on this book because I remember like getting that close to losing my child and being like, my life is just screwed up, you know? Like I was like the mm -hmm. most successful I had ever been in my career, yeah. um, but not, not doing what I love to do. And so I remember like on my, 40, my, my grandmother and I share a birthday, uh, June 2nd. Yeah. And, you know, I just remember on, on that birthday, like her looking at me and I was like, I think this is what it means to like be around your elders that like they can always tell what you need to hear because she pulled me to the side. And this is what she said to me in Spanish, of course. But she said, you know, you're, you're not you're not a branch, you're the trunk. And I thought immediately about how that ignited in me the sense of strength yeah. that it was like, yeah. you know, what breaks easily a branch. But you know what requires a lot of effort? A trunk. A yeah, trunk, And so yeah. like what she was saying to me in such few words, I was like the poetry that lives inside this woman, the wisdom to yeah. say exactly what I needed to know to like push forward. Yeah. Now, and and I, I like the uh, the the trunk, the trunk piece too, because it, it says, you know, you're the center too, right? That That's at least what I received from it when I read it. Mm -hmm. And when I read it at the front, I just, um I, I liked it a lot. So thank you for elaborating on that too Thanks. now these are the real easy questions here these, these are <laughs> these hands are off the, shorts. these yes these are the 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 pop culture round that we do uh just to wrap things up at the end so um first question we always ask is tell us I, i'm gonna i'm gonna add another layer to it but tell mm -hmm. us uh some good so audio right tell mm -hmm. us some good music or even a good podcast you've been listening to lately um that's been just feeding you well, I mean, I have to not to be a sucker, but I've been listening to a lot of books or pop culture. Oh. Um, no, I, have, I have, I have, I have been listening to it. I think I'm really digging it. I've been telling a lot of people to listen to it. Thank you. Um, and so when you invited me, I was very thrilled, actually, because I'm a big fan of your platform. Um, and I think what you're doing is really different. Like, I think it's just nerd heaven but i think there's also this really important way in which you're making relevant yeah. and let me just say this because this is like i'm like as nerdy as nerdy gets but i get so annoyed when like so much of like what propels culture is like television right yeah and i think yeah. a lot about how you know there was a time you know and it wasn't that long ago where like everyone came to books you know whether you're thinking back in the days of shakespeare you're thinking more mm -hmm. within our own communities where like you went to the person who told the best stories you know where there was no electricity it was like this kind of oral tradition um and how i just think books have fallen short like i think yeah. you know everybody has bought into this idea of like 
literature as needing to be this precious thing that doesn't move, that isn't exciting, that isn't sexy. And I think that because of that, we're losing ground, we're losing readers. And so yeah. part of like what I hope, you know, my books will do in the world is to like inject into this idea of like literary fiction, this idea of like excitement and thrilling and like a book that you can't put down because why mm -hmm. should we be writing books that people can like put yeah, down and not pick up there. for weeks, right? Like what mm -hmm. the hell are any of us doing if like people can like pick up the book, you know, whenever. So I just, you know, I love that so much of what you're doing within this platform is making it relevant, making books relevant. And um, I admire that a lot. Thank you. No, thank you so much for you saying made, that. Um, made even the pop culture question <laughs> deep. Yeah, <laughs> hey, look, look. <laughs> No, I mean, and it's yeah. I, I might even have to talk to you further about that off off camera. But thank you. That that means so much, truly. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I might skip the TV piece. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you watching the TV? Based off. I like TV all the time. Uh, don't let me do you. Say, should I? Is it, is it safe here to uh, to to ask that? <laughs> Listen, we contain multitudes. Yeah, okay. yeah. There's ooh, so ooh, much ooh. space okay. in black. Yes, there is. There is okay. I just had to make sure that it was that it was safe first before I. So I, any, I binge uh, I binge a lot of television. Yeah, <laughs> any, I am, yeah, I binge any good that. TV or movies you've come across recently? Well, I have to say I do, and I feel like I don't know which of the episodes it was that the two of you were talking about how um how this is, it's almost like an embarrassment of riches. When you yeah. think about all, oh all of the, I also Achille, I couldn't believe when you were like you've never watched Insecure. I was like, what? Oh yeah, yeah, still, <laughs> like, yeah, 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 nah. <laughs> what One in day. the world is happening? Yeah, um, yeah. But you know, I think about that a lot because you know my husband is very much into like thrillers and scary stuff, and mm. so we watched um, Black Mirror, we watched uh, Stranger mm. Things. Um, we watch Ozarks, you know, which I think yes. is is so dark. And in some ways, my fiction tends to be, I mean, the two books that I'm working on now are both like, you know, considerably darker than this one. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm always, you know, well, we're gonna make up some time, right? Oh, yeah, really yeah. Gap. For, for <laughs> sure, mm -hmm. for sure. But I, I just, you know, I feel like one of the things too that I, I love, um, about consuming a lot of pop culture is that you know i think we have to be in conversation with uh like current culture like i think it's really interesting that so often literature and writers are considered like tastemakers or like social transformation magicians and I think that was true at one point, but it's not true today, right? Like, I think when you think about music and you think about film and television, like that's really shaping culture in like a very yeah. rapid way. And so, you know, I still love books and I think books bring something to the table that other forms of, of, um, of entertainment, let's say, don't. And so I'm really interested in like finding out. So like I look at, you know, a lot of comedy, like, you know, I, I, I love comedy shows because I think like if you've got even a little bit of humor, God, you can have people stick with you through a lot in a book when you're dealing with like dark, really important and juicy and deep social issues. Like if you can imbue, you know, like sexy moments and like humorous moments in the book, people will hang with you. And so yeah. I really do come to, you know, shows like Insecure and you know, I've been watching like Working Moms, which is like such a like, it's it's like, a bunch of white women in Canada, you know, and it's like <laughs> dealing with like what it means to be a working mother um, and like the most absurd things that happen. But like the main character in that show, I think is like so flawed yeah. and she's really easily permeable. Like whoever she's with, they kind of influence who she is. And I find that so fascinating because I don't think white women ever give in that yeah. like yeah. they are so heavily influenced, you know, so I love that for that. Um, but yeah, I, I consume probably more TV than it makes sense. Um, because I just, I'm always like, I want to know what's hot. I want to know what people are talking about. I want to mm. be in the know. And I want like whatever books I write, I want my books to be part of the conversation that isn't happening in this elite space of books. 
Yeah. I mean, if, if it's meant to make any difference in the world, I think the book has to be functioning outside of of one little, um, you know, yeah. space. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, there was, I love all of that. I love <laughs> all of that. I'm serious. Like, the, uh, I can't, I, uh, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, TV watchers. Yeah, no, no like geez, there's so much, <laughs> there's so much in there that is relevant. You TV watchers, and I'm just trying to, I got to be respectful of Clavis's time here, so that's why I was just like, let me just, unfortunately, ask this, uh, this next question here, which is actually a good one though. Um, a book you've been uh, reading um, and enjoying lately? Ooh, I read a lot. I mean, let me just say, Achilles. For those of you who like TV watchers, we also are book readers. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I read, I read so, so much. Um, so let me say this, like I am usually like listening to a book um, on audio mm. and then juggling two or three books at the same time. Yeah. And right now I, I just finished Viola Davis's Finding Me. Did you do audio or did you do like? I did audio. And let me tell you, I just been telling people like just don't even go to the movies. <laughs> Netflix, forget Netflix and chill. Like I cannot even be whatever money this woman made, give her more. Okay, give her more because <laughs> my God. <laughs> and you know when I posted to my stories, I was like, you know, she don't need my help selling books because I know she can sell books. But anybody who hasn't read that book, I think you know. And I. I think about that, you know, I grew up in a home where there was a lot of violence. There was physical mm -hmm. violence and there was sexual violence. And it was yeah. a violence that happened to both my mother and that happened to us as children. And, you know, I just think that when, and I'm working on a, a memoir project that is like very painful, and very slow. So I don't even count it when I'm talking about the work, the books I'm working mm -hmm. on. Like the, you know, I'm doing essays because it's like easier to do a, a little bit at a time. And so, you know, when I think about how critical it is for us to talk about, like, the violence that happens within our home, you know, and that's why, you know, there's a lot of violence in, in Neruda and the Park as well. I mean, it's an important mm -hmm. part of the book, too, because I think it's an important part of what we need to grapple with in our culture. Um, but that book and that woman, I mean, the way that Viola Davis talks about her childhood and the poverty and like, you know, the violence that was happening in her home. And like, then the way that we see like her career and just the way that things happen for her, I just felt like, oh, I am so, I mean, and I was already a big fan of hers. And now yeah. I'm just like, oh my goodness. It's, I, yeah. I mean, I have to say it's been a while since I have been so moved by a memoir. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I loved, I loved hers. I think in terms of fiction, you know what I would recommend? I mean, the books that I've been reading that have been really moving. Um, I I read Night Crawling by mm. Layla Whiteley. Have yeah. you have you read it? Have the two of you read it? I haven't read it yet. So just, um, got the copy, but yeah, having uh, not not yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah we, stay, I think, we stay strapped. Yeah, yeah I think. I mean, yeah. I'm like, I need to go. Don't let me in your house. I'll steal your books. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, like, I think I met Layla because we both are coming from the same publishing company and they they put us together in, in an event and um, a virtual event. And then we ended up hitting off and becoming friends and we exchanged ARCs. And so I got to read an earlier version of it. Um, and I just, you know, I think it's really remarkable. I, you know, I love books that are based on like real situations that have happened in life and i think like the way that she's dealing with you know this young young girl and her brother and like how they're left destitute and figuring it out for themselves and you know the way that you know the people who are supposed to be taking care i mean you already read the quote you know i often think mm -hmm. that the people who are meant to take care of us often what they want to do is control us and control our mm -hmm. bodies and so you know, I think that in that book, that to me is like a book near and dear to my heart. And she wrote it when she was 16. I mean, I can't even uh, yeah. remember what I was doing when I was that's, 16, but not yeah. writing books. Okay. Listen, mm -hmm. man. it's that's, a couple yeah. of it's a couple of young people coming up now. Like um, there, there's even the uh, not only Layla, but there's a, a guy in the UK too, Moses McKenzie has a book. Um, and all Grove and Ends, he he published that at like 24, and I was like, what I was, what was I doing? Like I know I wasn't even like knowing about books. 
and like knowing yeah. about fiction when I was 24. So both of them are just like so impressive to me. I'm so impressed. And then the last recommendation that I will make for the people listening, I always like to give recommendations in threes. So oh, my yeah. third one will be um, Celeste Mohammed wrote a book called Pleasant View. Mm. And yes. it is a novel in stories. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you, like, I was like, and I actually got to meet her yesterday because the Brooklyn Caribbean Lift Festival brought her to do like one a week long of uh, book touring here. Um, she won the Bocas Caribbean Literary Prize <coughs> this year. And so they, they have her out here. I got to meet her. And, you know, it was one of those things where, first of all, I like overdress. I mean, that's how I make up for growing up really dirt poor is that i'm so over the top with my outfits it's like you know yeah. i'm taking revenge on every single time yeah. in my life I'm like, hey, but i didn't have nothing to wear mm -hmm. um and so i like overdressed yesterday because i was so excited to meet her she was very kind she didn't remark on like my <laughs> little outfit <laughs> but that book pleasant view i mean i think that it's such a it's it, like to me, I just think of it as like a swag of a book, you know, because yeah, the breadth yeah. of it and the scope of it. And it is like every one of the chapters is a different character. And it is, you know, telling a story of a community in the Caribbean. And it's really dismantling these romanticized ideas we have about what it means to live in paradise, right? Mm -hmm. And it is dealing with some of the things that I find to be the most relevant in the Caribbean right now in terms of the same kind of class issues and gender issues that I'm most interested in grappling with. And the book is really funny. And the characters are really interesting. And, you know, there's a, a moment at the end where I felt like it transcends itself, the book. Like it does something really complicated um, mm. that I, you know, I won't ruin it for readers, but I think it's one of those books where it's like, oh, this person is working on just a different level and I want to mm. read it because I want to learn how to do it. Mm. Word, word. Well, I know I'm so. Let's see. Yeah, let's see what... <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I have it and all that, but yeah, like that, it definitely doesn't like hop, skipped and jumped a couple of things. No disrespect. Mm. <laughs> it definitely doesn't oh, hop, skipped and jumped a couple excellent. things. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Is it on me now, Reggie? Yes, sir. All right, all right. <clears throat> Tell us who you would like to see as a guest on Books Are Pop Culture. But the caveat is this person has to be someone who you would be willing to help us connect with in the event that we may need help. Oh yeah, I wanna I wanna think about somebody really good. I like this question actually. I like how, mm -hmm. and so let's make sure it isn't someone you've already had here, mm -hmm. um, because I would love to hear you talk with Donnie Walton. Have you talked to Donnie? Yeah, yeah. so we we had her back in our Instagram live days. She's yeah, she's yeah. a I guess a BAPC OG. Ah, oh, you yeah. yeah. I'm like first of all, everybody that I say you're gonna you would have had her. Okay, so then I have to think about someone that maybe is more recent. I, I, mm -hmm. I will say this though, Donnie Walton bigged up your book way back then too. So oh, I just wanna that is a nice full circle moment though. So oh, I yeah. love Donnie, yeah. and I feel yeah, like her yeah. book. I mean, I'm so glad that it won. Um, oh, the Aspen. You know that it won the Aspen, but I also felt like she was robbed over the last we year. Said, yeah, I mean, we that said book the same thing. Oh, so yeah. brilliant! Oh my yeah. goodness! Yeah, they they mm -hmm. acting like they acting like people just do voice like that every day, but that's oh, a whole nice. other. That's yeah. a whole other story. I mean, it is so must. Um, but yeah, so I would say, um, what about my friend Socho Gonzalez? Olga that is dreaming. We have, have had not her? had her. Have not. Listen, have not. my friend Socho is so freaking fly. Like, I yeah. just, you know, we were coming up together. Um, you know, we both decided to come back into this writing business, you know, after we both turned 40. And um, her book, Olga that is dreaming, is like just one of my favorite books I've ever read. I think it just does all the things, you know, it's like unapologetically political. It is a page turner, like you can't turn it down. And I think it's like, you know, she was a wedding planner. And I think the way that mm -hmm. she used her expertise, one of the things I tell my students by writing, you know, students, it's just like, don't shy away from like digging deeply into what you know. And, you know, for some of us, like for me, what I know from like the time I was three years old is food. I love food and I've been observing people making food. So there's something that I think I can do when it comes to writing about food that like maybe others cannot. And yeah. I think, you know, and I think that there's something that I think is so exquisite about Olga Dice Dreaming and the way that Socho, 
you know, kind of brings back like all the things she learned as a wedding planner and how it features in like, you know, what has happened to Puerto Rico in this country. Um, so definitely, I think you need to have her. You need to have her. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Hey, look, we're with, we're with. I, I, I agree with you. I agree. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so this is probably the easiest question of them all. I promise. Okay. Right? Um, how can people who, if for whatever reason today, they are seeing Clavis Natera for the first time, how can they keep up with your journey? <clears throat> um, you know, whether that's your social media website, where should people go to find the latest and greatest um, from Clavis and Tara? Oh, thank you for that. Um, I'm um, most active on Instagram. And so Clavis Natera there. And hang out with me in stories because I like put it all out there. You know, my workout, yeah. my kids, my books that I'm reading. Nice. Um, I try to keep like my posts on my wall actually pretty minimal and like business focus, I would say, like more book related or whatever is happening. I feel that. Um, but, you know, my personal self, I think I share most through stories in Instagram. Yeah, now, same, I, I, same. yeah, I was gonna say we all kind of on that wave, actually. Yeah, I'm a little wild in the uh, Insta stories. Yeah, because yeah. that, that's <laughs> that's the only place you're gonna see Sebastian and Penelope. So you know, yeah. Or, you know, yeah so that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. And I appreciate you know the pictures that you both post to your stories because I feel like you know it still amazes me that people just don't. I, I don't. I have much more engagement, obviously, in the last couple of months, but. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people don't really stay on stories. So I love that too, that like the only people that get to see it are like over that one day. Like whoever yeah, catches, yeah. catches it and then it's gone. It yeah. is a wrap. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So if you're watching, go to the Books of Pop Culture bookshop, which is bookshop.org slash shop slash Books of Pop Culture. Get your copy mm -hmm. of Naruto on the Park from our list called Pieces That Hit because this piece was hitting. It was hitting. Uh, it was yes. hitting. Um, Clavis, thank you so much for joining us today. We uh, we appreciate your time, your answers, um, your book too. Like everything you said about like, like just basically, I guess what authors are asking, right? With the time investment of a book and making sure that it's unput downable and like, yes. uh, there was a word I saw on the back among your blurbs, which was propulsive. The root on the park was all of that. So um, thank you for not only acknowledging that, but for like doing it for real word, um, word. And, and for talking to us. She's Clavis Natera. He's Achilles Missouri. I'm Reggie Bailey. This is episode 27 of the BAPC podcast. We'll see you next time. <laughs> TV smiles. <laughs>